shouldn't lose. You shouldn't lose time. No longer this All right. Donna. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. All right. What happened? Oh, it is. It is. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to see such a big crowd, but. Of course, there are some empty spaces, and I'm sure there'll be others coming in. Uh, we have this session on the uh, nutrition in the fragile and conflict-affected uh, uh, context. Uh, I don't want to take too much time on introducing the topic, but I think uh, just a few words on uh, the reason that you're here. I'm sure you understand the topic uh, well, and you want to know more about it. But it's, it's more of a concern in the context of in the context of, uh, is it working? Not working. Uh, in the context of uh, uh, nutrition, how important it is, uh, whether it is uh, uh, development challenges or it is uh, in the humanitarian uh, situation. Uh, we do know that uh, there are uh, nearly half the countries that uh, the Sun Movement is engaged in uh, that have uh, some kind of a humanitarian uh, crisis and, uh, and uh, they have uh, uh, operations that go on with uh, regular uh, appeals. Uh, we have challenges uh, in how the humanitarian uh, uh, structures uh, operate and we have challenges how the humanitarian structures uh, interact with the uh, development partners. And that's the reason why we are here to talk about how that uh, humanitarian development uh, nexus uh, uh, can be built uh, stronger, the bridge can be br built there such that we work uh, together uh, for a common goal of uh, uh, alleviating the problems of uh, malnutrition uh, in the populations in those countries. So we have, uh, we have four panelists here today. Uh, I will start with uh, Donna. Uh, Donna represents the civil society. Oh, I thought you already did that before we started the session. All right, number one is English. Number two is French. Number one is English. Number two is French. Number three is Spanish. Um, Lucy, request your your neighbor behind you. Do you understand? D does it does it work right now? Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, all I right, see. great. So we are we are in business with uh, translations as well. So now we have, uh, I was, as I was introducing the panelists, we have first uh, panel member on my on my immediate left, uh, Donna Donna Capelli. Did, did I say that right? Not it, Capilli, so not Italian. Clarification. I come from Rome, so my accent is becoming a bit Italian, so forgive me for that. Uh, Donna is uh, the uh, Scaling Up Nutrition C Civil Society Alliance in Philippines, uh, part of the steering committee there, uh, has, uh, has been a consultant on maternal and newborn uh, health, uh, and is a neo neonatologist by, by training. Uh, and uh, also, is a part of the uh, National Nutrition uh, Cluster Technical Working Group uh, in Philippines. Uh, immediately left of uh, 
Donna is uh, Dr. Abdi Farah. Uh, Interpreters cannot hear me because this mic is not working. Okay. Okay, I'll try not to eat it. <laughs> okay, is that better? Is that better for the translators? That's okay? All right. Uh, Dr. Farah is uh, a medical doctor with a master's degree in both uh, public health uh, nutrition and health systems management. He has uh, nearly two decades of uh, experience in health and nutrition related uh, institutions. He served as the director general uh, at the federal level with Ministry of Health and is a sun focal point uh, in the office of the Prime Minister in Somalia. Immediately left of Dr. Farah is none other than a very familiar face, uh, Gerda Werberg. Uh, I know she uh, 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 says it in a different, uh, different accent, but that is, uh, that is her accent. Uh, Gerda, I think all of us uh, know her very well. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, coordinator for the uh, Scaling Up Nutrition Movement based here in Geneva, leading uh, uh, the uh, nutrition agenda in, in the Sun Movement countries. Uh, vast experience uh, both at uh, political level engagement and in the uh, Committee for Food Security. And, uh, and other initiatives with, uh, uh, in the context of, uh, of nutrition. Uh, one thing I promised Gerda in her introduction, I will uh, make a mention of is she believes in the long running, uh, runs marathons, but also I think in the development context becomes very appropriate that uh, uh, going the full distance uh, becomes uh, very essential and she makes sure that uh, when we start something, we go to the finish line, which is far, far away, but she sees that finish line and sees, uh, takes us through to the finish line. So uh, thank you, Gerda, for that. Uh, finally, last but not least, Josephine Ippe, uh, who is the coordinator of the Global Nutrition Cluster uh, based out of uh, UNICEF in uh, Geneva. Uh, now Josephine has uh, two and a half decades, over two and a half decades of experience in, in nutrition uh, with uh, various positions at uh, country level and has been the Global Nutrition uh, Cluster Coordinator now for four years? Well, a little more than four years. <laughs> uh, less than half a decade, let me put it that way. Uh, but uh, very actively engaged in the, in the nutrition agenda in the humanitarian context, but broadening that context to, to engage with other, uh, other stakeholders uh, in the development portfolio. So now I will start uh, now. With, uh, with one question to all panelists. And uh, my, my question is, when you see the, the title, Nutrition in the Context of Fragile and Conflict States, in very few words, maybe four or five words, can you tell us, starting with you, Donna, what comes to your mind immediately? What do you think of it? Um, so basically, with that question, what comes to mind? Four words: difficult, nearly impossible, uh, inaccessibility, and also uh, displaced uh, persons. Dr. Farr. Yeah. Good evening. In fact, when I hear about uh, such words, what comes to my mind is not leaving anyone behind. So that reaching the father, the, the fa uh, farthest, what do you call? Farthest reaching first. the farthest first, yeah. So that's what comes to my mind in fragile and conf complex uh, areas. We should treat also the kids there. Nutrition is the starting point to get better and to uh, avoid protracted uh, fragility. Yeah, what comes to mind is that uh, these are countries where the situation is uh, complex, but it's also going to be with us for a long time. So there's a need to really 
look at it differently, not just emergency focus. That's what comes to mind. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, it kind of sets the stage for what uh, our conversation is going to be today. Difficult, nearly impossible. Reach the furthest behind. Uh, nutrition. Uh, Best starting point to avoid crisis. And we are seeing more and more that uh, in, in conflict and uh, uh, context, the uh, challenges of nutrition and malnutrition is increasing. Uh, and that we need to look at it uh, from, the, from the broader context as well. So I think I will start, uh, Josephine, with, uh, with you first uh, with, a, with a question. And my question to you is, the, there are these challenges. We heard the, the difficulties. We heard about the impossibilities and the and the and the various uh, things associated with it. From your experience uh, uh, with the with the nutrition cluster, but also in addition to that, with your experience uh, from the field, what do you think needs to be done in the context of finances for nutrition in the humanitarian uh, context? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before I go to the finances, what needs to happen, I think. Thank you. Uh, sorry. sorry. May, may I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, our timekeeper here is yeah. uh, Marlon. Yes. And, uh, how, how much time do I have? No, I'll tell you. Yeah, uh, okay. So that I, your time is not being counted right now. All right. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, we have a total of five minutes. She will walk okay. you at three, yeah. two, and then one. Okay. So starting now. Okay. Uh, before I kind of talk about uh, what are the financial arrangements and the challenges, I, I think I would like to remind all of us about the fact that in all these humanitarian settings, oftentimes we think the problem is high level of acute malnutrition. But that's a myth. That's not true. And in a number of the fragile states, we have uh, in about 155 million children who are stunted are in fragile states. That means 36% of the, the number that we are talking about. And secondly, basic care practices like infant and young child feeding practices, uh, acceptable, minimum acceptable diet, and also prevalence of anemia, other micronutrient deficiencies is very high. And secondly, we also know that although wasting has a high risk, uh, you know, children who are wasted are at high risk of death, Equally important is that the standard children also carry high risk of mortality, and therefore it's very important that we focus on them. And finally, uh, in all the countries where the so-called fragile states are, we have seen that we have been implementing emergency nutrition program for over 10 years, Somalia and South Sudan and all this, which actually means that it's a situation which is going to be with us for a while, and therefore, uh, long, it's multiple, you know, multiple forms of malnutrition exist in these countries. Stunting rates are increasing, while wasting, which we have been addressing over time, has been persistent. I've worked in South Sudan years ago, over 10, 15 years ago. If you go back now, I go to the same regions where I worked, prevalence of acute malnutrition is the same, yet we have been uh, treating it. So because of that, I think we need to think of funding modalities differently. Currently, what do we have? We have various funding modalities. Uh, specific agency resource mobilization, uh, mobilized by agencies. The SAF, which is an emergency reserve fund given to the UN agencies. There is the pool fund, which is the more flexible fund provided at country level, not earmarked, so it can give, be given to the national NGOs who are the frontliners. But that forms only eight to 15, uh, uh, eight to about 20 percent or less. So you can imagine out of all the resources, that's the only flexible funding that we have. Finally, with that, although this funding source is flexible and it can maybe reach out to the frontliners, it's all short, short term. They are short term, uh, so they cannot expand. We cannot be able to implement programs which are longer term, which can 
have impact on stunting as well as, of course, wasting and the micronutrient deficiencies that I've talked about. And therefore, uh, I have a few suggestions, uh, two minutes, and I'm very sure I'm going to finish on time. Uh, for me, as we move forward, uh, I can see the following. One is that bridging the humanitarian development nexus is not about only extending the humanitarian fund. Yeah. It's about using the resources available for development to ensure that you know, we have the preparedness actions, it's costed, it's part of the sun, uh, uh, plan, the national plan of action. <laughs> Two, the humanitarians do things differently so that we also can focus on capacity building and ensuring that what the little we do remains behind, you know. And, and finally, three, five things quickly. One is ensuring we implement a, a, a package of intervention, high, um, uh, high impact nutrition intervention, not just some, but all the package, the, uh, the Lancet series, 13 interventions that we all know as nutritionists. Secondly, the integrated approach. Link, uh, leveraging the, the, the support from the other sectors because we know that nutrition, malnutrition is an outcome. We need to work better with WASH, health, food security, and so on. And uh, fine, um, third, we also need to be better at advocating with government, even in fragile states. Uh, placing nutrition in a, in a way, as Gada said, is the economic benefits, the health benefit, and document, rather communicating that better, turning that into the cost, if nothing is done. And also focusing on prevention, and finally, leveraging preparedness actions, uh, the, the development funds, as I said, and the longer term funds better, not just focusing on emergency. And I think with that, my time is up, and I would stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. And I think you set the stage very well with the, with the uh, uh, expanded view of the, uh, the nutrition status in, in the fragile context, in conflict uh, uh, countries. But I think you brought in some very important points in your, in your uh, brief summary at the end. And I think I want to take that to Dr. Farah, in particular, uh, in the country context. Uh, one of the things, and a, a couple of things that were uh, mentioned by uh, by Josephine were, was this role of the government in advocacy, advocating for uh, uh, linking the humanitarian and development funds and also uh, looking at some of the high impact uh, uh, actions that, were, that are going to be more for the long term building capacity for the long term rather than short. So in your experience in Somalia, can you give us some, some insights into how you've been able to uh, apply that uh, and what have been the challenges in doing so? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, it is a question that cannot be answered in 20 minutes. Let's <laughs> leave alone five minutes. But I will try to be as, uh, as precise uh, to the point as possible. Uh, if, if you look at uh, the role of the government in uh, humanitarian development nexus and bridging the two, in fact, it's very critical because uh, in the uh, past years, we used to avoid states. And uh, in humanitarian settings, people used to run away from states because maybe states was involved in the conflict. And uh, the development people also avoid uh, other organizations and run to the government. So they are state-centered, and this is I state phobia. So the government is the one now which can create the links between the two and bring the two together, particularly in terms of planning, because when we have a humanitarian response plan going on, at the same time we have a national development plan being formulated. If the two can be tied, the only forum that can be used to tie the two is the government. So the role of the government for advocating for uh, a humanitarian development bridge is really very important. In the case of Somalia, uh, we have uh, an active appeal, uh, as any other countries with crisis. But at the same time, we have a national development plan. And we also have uh, what we call RRF, uh, Reconstruction Resilience and, uh, and uh, Fund, which 
text talks about the resilience in long-term building. So what the government of Somalia has done is now to create a coordination that all of them can participate and link together. So that the DINA, which is the disaster impact assessment needs, really leads to or takes from the humanitarian response plan, which is already a plan, plan for, uh, to respond to a need. And they are dealing with a need, so two are tied. At the same time, the national development plan and the uh, reconstruction and uh, recovery plan are tied together. At the same time, they've, they have a, a short, uh, a very common mechanism to implement that, which is uh, the national development plan uh, and, uh, and uh, mechanism of implementation. For example, we have a national forum, which now the heads of UN agencies at a global level sit with the president and discuss issues related with development and, uh, and humanitarian at the same time. Down, if you go, we have what we call as uh, we have uh, we have Somali Development and Reconstruction Fund, which is also a forum that's shared between the two. So from here we develop the recovery plan, and from here we develop the humanitarian response plan. So both are actually actively involved. In this way, the government is really a center for bringing both together. The high impact uh, and. Uh, uh, and implementations and the programs. Really, Somalia is now in the form of formulating common results framework. And we're expecting this common results framework to have both an emergency and development aspects coming together. And that will be the mechanism that will bind both, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah. I'm, uh, uh, I think advi I'm advised that all those who are listening in English It'll also be good for you to put your headsets on uh, with channel zero zero uh, because the sound is, seems not to be carrying to the back. So can you do that as well? So there are some microphones. Thank you, Dr. Farah. I think uh, 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 Somalia is, uh, as we heard from Josephine, one of those long-standing uh, crisis countries. Uh, but uh, and and Dr. Farah elaborated on how. There was a distinction between the uh, humanitarian and development partners distancing each other. But now, the effort with the government in the leadership, the effort is to bring the national plan for development and the humanitarian response plan together so that the thinking is, planning is done together and response is done together. I think in this context, while government is, uh, uh, is uh, so critical, we all believe that the leadership has to come uh, from the government. But one of the front runners in, in both, in both uh, areas, whether it's development, but more so in, in crisis context, uh, we have uh, the civil society that plays a very active role, and particularly the local civil society. So my question to you, Donna, is in, in the context of when we heard about uh, the importance of capacity development, uh, civil society is in country, stays in country, particularly the, the national uh, local civil society. With the World Humanitarian Summit commitments, with, the, uh, uh, with this in mind that indeed if we want humanitarian response but long-term uh, uh, actions, things that will continue to be uh, in the country well, once the humanitarian uh, response uh, personnel have left, what do you see uh, civil society doing now and is there a change in the mindset uh, from, uh, from the various actors, including the uh, uh, donors, in terms of supporting this uh, uh, civil society, not just at international level, but also at the local level, connecting it to the capacity development as well. So certainly, um, I'm from the Philippines, and you know that my country is quite the target of a lot of natural disasters. Like every year, we have around 20 cyclones that visit our country and actually wreaks havoc with flooding. And apart from that, we also have uh, man-made conflicts. You know? So recently, as of last year, we did have uh, a crisis in southern Philippines, in Mindanao. Uh, there was an armed conflict there, uh, and it lasted 
lasted for five months. So definitely civil society is very important in the response uh, towards these uh, events, unfortunate events. Uh, as we know in, in, in disaster management, there's mitigation, there's preparation, there's the response, and then the rehabilitation uh, in which civil society needs to be very active. However, in, in my country, um, it is uh, SOP for our government to actually activate the local unit of government to respond uh, to the crisis. However, as we saw in Haiyan, uh, the local governments were themselves victims. So it really took quite a, a while, and presumably so if there were any civil society component within that vicinity, it would have been also impossible. But then there, were, there should have been other civil society organizations that would have been activated, um, not uh, in the area of the calamity or the devastation. However, it's not organized in that way. Uh, there's no current capacitation, I would say. Um, I believe that there should be criteria that would uh, that we should use so that we could delineate which civil society organization would be called in for this particular role in the response or even in the earlier ones, like in preparation. Uh, who can we tap to actually take up this role? And that this civil society group needs to be committed because it's one thing to just you know sign off and say you're committed, but to actually act uh, and go to where you're, you're, uh, where you're needed. So definitely, um, civil society needs to, to be in the thick of it, especially in the rebuilding phase, because um, humanitarian organizations, they're there for the early response. They're there, as we saw in, in uh, Typhoon Haiyan. Um, they had started to pull out like three, four months after that early response. And then, of course, there will be handing over to the local governments, and local governments are still shot. With what are they supposed to do? How are they going to pick up? Right? So they were all scrambling. And therefore, I see clearly that civil society should play a role in this, and we should really be capacitated uh, to take part, particularly in rebuilding, because we are local resources there already present, and we could really see through uh, the progress of development of rebuilding uh, in that situation. Thank you, Donna. I think uh, it's an important uh, point that you raise in terms of, yes, the humanitarian actors are present in the immediate aftermath of a crisis. But when they leave, they could leave a gap if they've not built local capacities. And very often, in crisis, similar crises that you've talked about, natural disasters, uh, even the local authorities are, uh, are impacted. And how do we build capacity uh, in, in that uh, context? Uh, but certainly, uh, civil society become an important uh, the player in the in the in the um, uh, response, uh, whether it's longer term or it's uh, the humanitarian short term action. Uh, Gerda, listening to all the all the inputs now, uh, my question to you is: Given the fact that more the 60 countries that we have under uh, the movement, we have uh, uh, a third at least who have regular uh, humanitarian crisis. What do you see as the role of the movement uh, in context with bring, bringing this multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral approach? And where do you see, and we heard the role of uh, civil society, we heard the role of government being uh, pivotal, we heard the challenges uh, with the, with the uh, nutrition situation in the conflict countries. What do you s see the role of the uh, Sun Movement, number one? And second question attached to that is, what do you see the leadership at the country level doing to make that change? 
thank you so much and thank you for organizing this important uh, topic because we i think we need to speak clear language here for me it's unacceptable to um, acknowledge here that humanitarian support needs to be um, projected for many many years because it is already for many years and i think the humanitarian summit back in 2016 in istanbul was there to bring change there was a strong plea and a strong agreement to bridge the gap between the humanitarian uh, support and the development support. Because let me be very uh, crisp and clear here, not meaning uh, to be um, unrespectful, but the humanitarian support is very often, uh, very often seen as a silo, as a siloed approach. We come into the country, we make the needs assessment because we have done it so many times. We know how to do it, how to do it. We do not involve too many players in that country because it's complicated to find them, to make use of them, to identify who in the departments, I have to slow down, um, who in the departments is available and reliable to work with, and how to identify where you start with the humanitarian and at what, what moment you can bring in the development partners already to create a bridge to create a bridge that is a natural uh, bridge, that is an evolving uh, bridge in order to have a decent handover. And let me um, here give the example of the Philippines. It was already given, Haiyan, um, in the very beginning, WFP and other UN organizations went there to provide the people, the victims, with food, and other went there to, to support them with housing, etc., in order to survive. But within a few weeks, um, uh, FAO and other partners came in in order to provide them with the seeds for farmers to go back to their area and to start start producing the first ne next crop in order to become more self-sufficient. Now, it's only one example, but I want to put this on the table. I don't think we should focus on funding too much. I think we should all step back, look into the mirror and ask how are we performing right now in the, uh, when we face a crisis, a fragile situation, and where and how can we open up or if you want step out of our comfort zone of knowing how we do it already for years um, etc how can we step out of our comfort zone in order to of course take care of the humanitarian situation but have a focus on how to soon as possible enter the phase of development building resilience self uh, uh, supporting uh, self-supporting uh, uh, people focusing on early warning, early action system, because that is what we need to uh, have in mind. As Sun Movement, we uh, will work with uh, countries and make use of our networks in countries, because indeed one third of our Sun Movement countries uh, are uh, facing um, uh, humanitarian or fragile situations from time to time. Uh, but I want to um, the, the humanitarian partners to step up, to first include uh, the people who are there, the networks who are there in the needs assessment, to make stunting also an indicator, because it is, uh, it's not right now, it's an indicator, it's not an indicator, maybe it's considered, but to uh, encourage also the government to take ownership where? it is possible and to build ownership of the government and only if we uh, take a different uh, approach we will be able to overcome fragility and as soon movement with all our networks we are very motivated to play our role in this half a minute half a minute spare for the discussion <laughs> okay, thank you thank you Gerda for for that input and I think what you you raised some very critical points and I think one of the important takeaways is, of course, the capacities of the government, uh, build that uh, capacity for the government to take that leadership role, but most importantly is in a humanitarian crisis, think about the sequencing of response from initial stages. The example that you gave, 
was when, when a humanitarian response in the immediate aftermath, you provide relief assistance, but gradually and rather rapidly start thinking about the, the, the recovery actions, the resilience building, and the long-term uh, actions for the communities so that they can, they can uh, uh, fend for themselves and therefore, uh, in addition to look at, uh, not, uh, not only look at uh, malnutrition as, uh, as the uh, uh, acute malnutrition uh, uh, aspect, but also to look at it in the context of longer term, the stunting, which, uh, which uh, Josephine had indicated is, is a major issue in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in these uh, uh, countries as well. Uh, thank you all for your first round of uh, interventions. Uh, I would like to use this opportunity to open out uh, this discussion for, uh, for you uh, to respond to. Uh, I would also request uh, all of you to keep your comments uh, brief. Uh, we will have our time, uh, timekeeper managing that part as well, so please uh, keep your uh, response brief and, and precise to the point of what you would like to, like to make. We would like to hear some examples of uh, uh, where you face challenges. Maybe some can help us with how you overcame those uh, challenges that you faced. Uh, Forward-looking in terms of what uh, 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 actions have taken, in, uh, taken place in your countries and where others can learn from, uh, from those, uh, those uh, actions that have taken place. Uh, so over to, to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to ask the questions. And I am Hu Kran from uh, Sun Civil Society, uh, Cambodia. I am from uh, Helen Keller International. Now, uh, in Cambodia, we have the National uh, Disaster Management Committee. We are, you know, like uh, the member of this committee, I mean, from the government, but also include the UN agency and the NGO, those who are supporting the disaster uh, response. And the experience was that, uh, you know, working together with different stakeholders, you have the success and challenge. The challenge is that, you know, different uh, stakeholders have different ideas, you know, how the response should be uh, focused. The good thing is that, you know, like the UN agency leading by you, a World Food Program, for example, they uh, work together with uh, the NGO like Save the Children and others who are working in their, um, you know, disaster response and come to the good solutions. But then, you know, like when the response next period, the action is over, then uh, the continue, continue of that uh, process, you know, beyond after the disaster, it has been always a problem. I mean, they may have the resource for time being to support, including the government, but after that, you know, like uh, it's a problem. So I want to ask a question from other country, you know, how you can support, you know, beyond the the response during the disaster, I mean, after the short time of the, the disaster. So if I, if I got you right, what you're asking is, while there is funding available for a humanitarian response, but once the, that funding dries up, how do you continue if you have to do the recovery and uh, long term? So. Yes, indeed, uh, I think it's a very important uh, aspect. So anybody who has uh, experience will be happy to hear from you how you transitioned from uh, crisis to recovery. We have a question. Yeah. Bien, merci bien. Je suis le représentant du gouvernement du Niger, donc le pont focal du du Niger. Je devrais être sur cette table, mais excusez-moi pour des problèmes logistiques. Ça n'a pas pu être comme ça. Et je vais un peu euh, décrire la situation, euh, euh, l'impact des crises 
des conflits sur la nutrition au Niger. Le Niger a une, euh, dans une situation vraiment de conflit avec euh, deux à trois zones dont presque tout le monde ici connaît le Boko Haram qui sévit dans la région est du Niger. Aussi le conflit du nord Niger nord Mali qui font des dégâts au niveau de la, de la zone ouest et de la zone nord. Et quels sont les effets de ces conflits euh, au niveau de, sur la nutrition euh, Du point de vue prise en charge nous avons des sérieux problèmes puisque euh, presque toute l'aide financière est, est reconvertie en, en, en urgence et est financée au niveau de ces différentes zones. De telle sorte qu'il euh, y a beaucoup plus même de besoins, et de, beaucoup plus d'interventions que de besoins. Je me rappelle à un moment, même du point de vue gouvernement, on parlait de No Mass Land au niveau de DIFA puisque tous les humanitaires sont là-bas et on a laissé les trois principales régions qui sont et qui ont la, euh, plus la prévalence de malnutrition, surtout le retard de croissance. Et dans ces régions, environ 50% de, de, de retard de croissance. Et toutes ces régions ont été abandonnées. Et... Ok. Excusez-moi. Donc, je parlais de euh, cette situation qui a drainé les différentes aides vers les zones de conflit et que au niveau de trois principales régions qui sont le site ou le siège de malnutrition, toutes ces, euh, ces aides sont euh, déviées. Maintenant, par rapport au financement de l'État, et le financement de l'État suit, s'il vous plaît, le financement euh, intérieur, euh, extérieur. C'est-à-dire, euh, la priorité de l'État est dirigée directement vers ces zones de conflit. Actuellement, où nous sommes, nous avons un sérieux problème de prise en charge, au moins c'est la prise en charge de la malnutrition au niveau des autres régions, de régions, des autres régions du pays, dont les trois principales. Et là, vous voyez ce que ça crée comme euh, problème sur la nutrition. Mais là, le plaidoyer que je ferai, c'est juste pour voir comment est-ce qu'on euh, peut aider beaucoup plus dans cette situation les pays fragilisés par les conflits. Merci bien. As you all know that my country, Afghanistan, is a, a fragile state and war-affected country. Uh, in uh, my country, the ongoing war prevents uh, the humanitarian as well as the development uh, uh, services, uh, uh, which results in a lack of nutrition services for the people there. Uh, prevention uh, interventions in uh, such a setting like in my country, uh, they are not easy. Uh, so uh, I got two questions. Uh, what uh, are the uh, most effective strategies so far uh, for the interventions which could address double burden of malnutrition in the fragile and less developed settings. Second, uh, as my country is a new Sun uh, member state, which uh, joined uh, this movement last year, uh, my government has uh, shown its commitment. Uh, we have uh, formed the needed structure for uh, the needed uh, coordination among all stakeholders. Uh, but it takes time. Uh, we have already started working on our national strategy, uh, addressing uh, the uh, nutrition problem in my country with the uh, help of Sun and uh, MQ Sun Plus and DFID and UNICEF. Uh, but uh, what can Sun uh, do more for us to uh, get technical support and also uh, for the special uh, and, uh, circumstances uh, in my country to uh, uh, get financial support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. We'll take one question and I would want to bring back some of the issues that have been raised to the panel. 
thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity. Um, I will just uh, express um, some issues uh, from Bangladesh, and that is uh, a current crisis that's ongoing there. I had visited that place three times uh, on behalf of uh, our civil society organization. First, when they were coming in. Second, when we were settling them and making ma uh, makeshift uh, um, uh, centers for health centers for rehabilitation, etc. And just before coming, I visited again. And this time is the post. Not so much are coming, not so emergency period is over, and now settling. I just very much agree with my friend from Cambodia. The situation is very different in different stages. Now that the picnic period is over, a lot of people have gone, their publicity is done, their fund is raised and everything, and people are becoming less and less interested. And you may be, it may be shocking that 27 children died of uh, diphtheria in these camps during the second phase. And so many people are getting malaria, so many people are getting more disease, more waterborne, foodborne disease are, are coming now, more stunted children, more wasted children. It's a post-emergency when the period is over. It's a complex situation. The people are displaced from their homeland, so they are stateless. They are homeless. A lot of the children, in the last couple of months, 20, thousand children have been born and another 20,000 is expected to be born is next. And situation is um, to talk about the pre mitigation, prevention. The government has in fact the disaster management uh, system. They are very good organization, the government organization, because they do face man-made as well as natural disaster. And also, what I, I have, uh, we have here is the National Nutrition Cluster. And this cluster is made up of government, UN organizations, international organi humanitarian uh, people, and all the members of the Sun Civil Society actions who are working there, like INGOs, Helen Keller, uh, Save the Children, all. This cluster is made up of all these people. Now, what I'm, um, my next uh, question is, from the Sun Movement and from the, um, uh, the global cluster, how can this situation be linked from a central level to the country concept? Bangladesh is just one of the countries, but many countries have the similar, similar problem. And so this is um, all situation is disaster, complex, but man-made and disaster, natural disaster, the handling is a very little different by the fact that in the Cox's Bazaar situation, there is a lot of a security problem. And you are not allowed to go after four after six o'clock. So what happened to the emergency? That is another issue. So taking all this into consideration, I think we have to think how do we do our, our the, the sun movement can take it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for your inputs. I want to take this back, uh, some of your questions back to the panel. And I want to start with uh, Dr. Farah first on this one. I think uh, we, we've heard from countries basically saying that uh, when there is a humanitarian crisis and the peak of the crisis, we have uh, good funding available, short term, but then the, uh, uh, the, the profile of that emergency reduces for whatever reasons, and it transitions to the recovery development phase. However, at that stage, the, fi the finances to support those same individuals are limited. Whereas in the earlier phase, there was a lot of attention, a lot of funding available from donors. Now, from your experience, uh, and I also want to connect it to the other Niger and uh, Afghanistan question as well, in terms of 
when there is a crisis, resources are diverted from the development context into the humanitarian crisis area, and then uh, the, uh, uh, those development areas suffer. From your experience in Somalia, because you've gone through these, uh, these cycles, and you have uh, different uh, levels of these interventions, how, did, how has Somalia dealt with it? Okay, thank you very much. I, I'd really say that uh, the only answer to preparedness uh, to the, for the continuity of humanitarian to development is only preparedness. If we have a cycle of repeated uh, uh, man-made or natural disasters happening, the only answer to the sustainability is to avoid it happening or to be ready for it when it's happening. I don't think that the humanitarian actors can guarantee a continued fund after emergence, and that's the nature of them. Because when there is an emergency somewhere, and that emergency is silenced, their action goes back, and they may be concentrating on another area which has the similar action, similar problems. So what I would, uh, and the government of Somalia normally does, and it is just part of the, of the world where preparedness is very, very limited and very, very small, because majority of the times preparedness is left for the government to do. And that leaves the limited accessibility of funds, the limited resources, the limited humanitarian um, and human resource, as well as capital resources for the government to be able to put measures to mitigate problems before they happen. And, and the only reason why problems happen at the same time have the same impact as last year or the other year past is that because there was no a real preparedness for that. So what I would advise is countries to impact more on d disaster preparedness plans. And those plans need to be funded. The other thing is uh, I don't agree with my friend from Cluster when she said that the humanitarian the development funds should be used for humanitarian. And instead I would say the humanitarian funds should be a foundation for development to kick off. Not that we do, we do the, 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 the development funds to come back to the preparedness. And I agree with Gerda, we don't have to expect emergencies to continue forever. Governments should not sit and now wait for uh, humanitarian response to come all the time or continue even after it's over. It is a mixture of, uh, of movement that needs to happen, which, which is now answer to the needs when there is an emergency, but at the same time take lessons from it and prepare for it next time so that you have less impact of it and less severity of it. Even you can, if you cannot stop, if it's a major, maybe you can't stop it. But the impact should be really reduced in a way that preparedness should be focused on, building resilience of the communities, enabling them to live for their own, and en enabling the coping capacities of those communities. These are the only answers to the sustainability of, uh, and, uh, of disaster response and, uh, and, and plans. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, from, from what I hear from you, the juries are up on who should fund whom. But I think the message is very clear that we need to have uh, our efforts such that we can we are working together in a way that we are thinking of the long term while we are doing short term actions as well. Uh, and I think that will depend on country context and country situation in terms of how the funding can be used because I think one of the missing factors here to me today in our, in our discussions, and I don't know if there is anybody in the audience from the donor community, because there are challenges on that side as well in terms of how uh, funding is made available and how whether they can be transitioned. But there are soft transitions that can be put in place from both sides, uh, particularly when you mention on uh, preparedness, early warning systems, and uh, uh, response as well. Uh, Donna, from the civil society perspective, because one of the things we notice, uh, one of the things we've heard is that uh, humanitarians leave and uh, the uh, visibility is less and therefore uh, uh, the work uh, that was intensive at a phase is, uh, 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 suddenly disappears. What would you see as the role of civil society 
and particularly local civil society in such a context? So thank you for that question. Um, it's weird, I can hear myself. No, you can hear yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, okay, so I, I just want to reframe it again. Uh, we were talking about how uh, during humanitarian crisis, all the resources are there, and then once they ship out, then not much is left, and how do we rebuild? But I want to reframe this. We have to work on mitigation or on prevention. When we talk about nutrition, because I've heard a lot about stunting and wasting, really we have IYCF. <laughs> we Right? So we need to get that grounded, and that is where civil societies like Sun, no, we, no, uh, oh sorry, infant and young child feeding and breastfeeding. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my favorite is to really say that these have to be prepositioned already. So even in normal times, um, we always think about capacitating for that response in the crisis, but we should capacitate even during the normal times when these should all be in place. And this is linked to universal health coverage, right? We need to provide quality standard care. And, and Uh, a WIC space, or sorry, a women infant child friendly space <laughs> over at uh, an airport. It was a military airport uh, to which they were evacuating uh, those who had survived Haiyan. And I tell you, um, and this is what really started that pocket of movement from the local civil society or came down from the C-130s, the planes, they were being handed bottles. Bottles that were not, we're not even sure if were sterilized. They already had milk powder in them and they were being handed uh, mineral water alongside. And so right there and then we thought we need to act on this and so we, we we actually insisted to have a space within that evacuation camp. And really, uh, there needs to be clear communication coordination about what a women, infant, child friendly space is. Because we got to be known as the baby area or the play area. But really, there was more important things that needed to be done. We were doing breastfeeding counseling. We had the support of mothers. We have a fantastic group of mothers uh, who were organized via social media. Right now, this group of mothers, they're called Breastfeeding Penais. They're actually around 200,000 strong already on social media. So this was that group of mothers who had helped us to tide over these women temporarily. And we gave them that solace, that comfort. And we also reaffirmed them in that they were able to continue breastfeeding despite, despite the very tragic circumstances that they had just experience that they had lived through and really that that symbol of the bottle being given to them makes them think so is this really uh, now the you know now the good thing that's going to happen we're going to be given this because really there are myths the myths are I'm sorry but the myth is that they it's not it's not quite adequate but then they get validated, they're reaffirmed. We tell them, you're such a hero, you were able to really save your child during this crisis, and that was a great thing. <laughs> Thank you, I think, I think there's, a, there's a very good lesson to be learned here, and I think what I hear is that if, if you know exactly what you want to do, you will find the, the, the means to get there, and one of the critical things is the, is the issue of infant young child feeding, in particular, ensuring mothers continue to breastfeed and they are not, not diverted by the example you gave of handing over bottles for, uh, for the mothers as soon as they arrive uh, 
uh, into safer zones. Uh, Josephine, one thing that I wanted to ask you, and in the context of what was raised by the others, there are, there are these challenges. We are talking about nutrition being multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder. Uh, one of the things that keeps coming to mind is that while in the, uh, in, uh, within the Sun movement and in the development context, we are working with the multi-stakeholder platforms, we have others engaging. What do you see in the humanitarian context that can be done something that is similar to learning from the development uh, context of uh, having, this, uh, having the various stakeholders working together such that you have this long-term vision built in, the capacity is developed. Uh, can you give your thoughts on that? Sorry. Before, oh, well, the same thing, I'm listening to myself, and it doesn't work like that. Yeah, sorry, I've, just to uh, respond to Farah first, I, I didn't, I, I think, <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, yeah, exactly, I think you completely maybe misunderstood what I said. Uh, the emphasis for me is on a package of intervention, that's what I said. I also said that the little that we do during humanitarian has to be sustainable so that it builds and then we leave something behind yeah but I also said that it all has to be in tandem the preparedness action has to be done before and then the humanitarian has to build on that that was what I said I'm a strong believer of you know building on and leaving something behind and that is also based on music, no yeah, and, and 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 that means also uh, <laughs> ensuring that humanitarian funds are used effectively. Yeah, uh, in relation to the question you raise about the the multi-sectorial, like during the humanitarian response, how could we ensure that we do things differently, including also building or linking better with the intersectorial aspect of the way SUN does. Uh, I think there are several issues that we really need to look at in the way we work. One is the focus, as we said, on uh, you know, uh, wasting really needs to change. In the, I'll give you an example of the context of Syria and Ukraine, the early days of Syria. This is a country where 20 percent of the mothers are, were breastfeeding exclusively, okay? But it was in a context where the hygiene situation was a little bit better, they had access and so on. All of a sudden they all moved out and we needed to focus on uh, you know, promotion of breastfeeding, ensuring they have the environment to feed their children appropriately, including uh, a safe uh, breastfeeding corner. And I can assure you when we raised this issue and we said Syria and Ukraine nutrition has to be focused, the donors and everybody was telling us no. But there's no problem. It's, it's you know, it's uh, uh, stunting, rather, the sum levels are very low. Global acute malnutrition is very low. So in the nutrition sector cluster, what we are focusing on now is really repackaging our intervention and looking at the nutrition sensitive, rather specific intervention, which is in line with what you do in Sun. Secondly, also then, uh, looking at what is, even with, within a humanitarian context, what are those package of nutrition sensitive intervention that we can start building on and linking better with other sectors. And finally, working better with existing structures, government structure, uh, in Somalia, in South Sudan, wherever, ensuring that there's co-leadership with government. It's not up to us, it's the government that has to lead these actions. And for me, those are the actions that we can take to ensure in countries where there's already existing sun, building on that structure, not creating new structures. And that will take a while, but step by step, in a number of countries, that is what we, we think would make a change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. I, I want to pose it to Gerda now. I think uh, kind of set up, set the stage for uh, from Josephine's comment or using the existing structures. But I think there were a few questions pretty much directed to the Sun Movement. What can the Sun Movement do and help us uh, at country level? Because we at country level are committed and are working towards yeah. uh, uh, 
uh, bringing nutri uh, improving nutrition status? Actually, I share your impatience because we're talking too much about funding mm -hmm. and we're focusing too much uh, on funding and we're talking too little about people, about people keeping in their resilient uh, zone or supporting people to get back to their resilient uh, zone, to uh, get back to dignity and self-supporting. And I, I, cont I, I would like to emphasize this because this is the mistake we make all the time. We talk too much about funding and too little about uh, people. How do we keep people in their strength or how do we bring people back as soon as possible towards dignity and putting them in their own strength again? That should be the topic. And here I want to raise a few critical things and it's, it's never meant uh, personally. But I think the UN is pointing at governments and governments are pointing at the UN. And we're all waiting because we know exactly what to do. But the question is, how do we do it? And are we really ready to open doors and to open our minds to rethink what are to rethink? What are, for instance, the no regrets? Where can we start with? What is the low hanging fruit? And I think we heard already um, a very good examples of uh, breastfeeding and how important uh, this is. So having said this, I'm interested in inviting all uh, country members here, country people here in the room, put this on the agenda of the UN and uh, encourage the UN to coordinate better and to also support the government to take that ownership, to build that network that is necessary to build uh, uh, preparedness and resilience and early warning and early because it's unacceptable to just consider that we will have the humanitarian situation for decades uh, more. It's unacceptable and we should start right here and now building upon the excellent outcomes of the humanitarian uh, summit. It's on paper, it's there, it's not rocket science, but it's being ready to work with everybody, opening doors, which means for civil society that if they know uh, companies in their uh, network that are there and that are available, like for instance in Ethiopia, there are there were is, is a business network that said, okay, would we have been involved in making an assessment on where we are now, we would have contributed better and we are we stand ready for next time so it is the focus we need let me make one more critical uh, remark which is for the donor states for the donor uh, states because as soon indeed if there is the focus of the cameras um, uh, if the emergency is highlighted you see the funding starting coming in and all ministers etc doing very well I don't criticize this but also these um, donor actions should uh, be focused on how to build from the very beginning the bridge between humanitarian and development, focusing always on preparedness. So we should also put on the agenda wherever we are and wherever we go, civil society in civil society, private sector in private sector, donors, countries in uh, at the level of the, of the UN and where you have meetings. Um, how do we together build this agenda? We want to take our responsibility, you have to take your responsibility. And let me tell you this, as long as we continue to discuss funding, we will not get there. Only if we start thinking in people and opportunities and uh, preparedness and people back into dignity and uh, back into strength, we will start to get there. Thank you very much. People-centered approach, and I think that's what we are, uh, uh, we are talking about. Um, Given the time, we have enough time for a second round of questions from the, from the audience. So maybe we can start. Yep. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah. My name is Tabassum. I'm a journalist from India. Now, India is not a country in a conflict situation, but malnutrition is a huge, there's a huge burden of malnutrition. And uh, if I'm not wrong, Sun has partnered with three states in India for, uh, for helping co combat malnutrition. Now, there's an increased focus on ready-to-use therapeutic food, the RUTF in India, and 
already there are civil society groups which are opposing the move because the cost is going to be escalated it's a short, they, they believe it's going to be a short term measure and to sustain or to combat malnutrition on a long term basis we do need local locally prepared hot cooked meals to to help kids to help kids uh, combat malnutrition so i want uh, responses from each one of you, of you i'm sorry so i would like to have response from each one of you on comparing the cost factor in both in uh, rutf food items and in locally prepared food and in ensuring i mean how do we ensure that we do get funders and sponsors on a long term basis because this is a project which requires a lot of cost thank you on behalf of the civil society uh, network of sri lanka uh, i will uh, speak some experience about uh, supporting to her question as well uh, tona mentioned about the civil society contribution uh, for the uh, during the emergency times they are uh, as she mentioned about the rutf they are uh, i i remember when there was uh, there there's a flood uh, situation in the country sri lanka the ministry of health requested the support of the civil society uh, support in preparation of um, complimentary food for the children above 6 months so then the civil society group uh, went there and uh, they started uh, doing it supporting the mothers to give a good um, complimentary feeding rather than uh, taking the uh, therapeutic food for the uh, the severely malnourished children or any other like baby ras go any other baby food uh, they are stopping uh, bringing it to the camp sites so those are the things if we can support the civil society and then empower them uh, to coming up with uh, helping at the situations like emergency so then uh, they can take hand with the un uh, or the technical people and then the ministry of health uh, supporting to that so then i think uh, the sun we have a good role to play there uh, empowering the uh, mothers to come to uh, that level Thanks. i'm good afternoon i'm in atta from sierra leone we are not a conflict country but we've been um, unfortunate with natural disaster So during the Ebola we had just for the IYCF in terms of managing this is just come in terms of managing the infant formula we had so many donations and everything and it was a problem but we also set up the nutrition emergency technical committee that was managing the nutritional aspect in terms of the Ebola crisis so one of the thing we did was to develop a standard of operation procedures for emergency for nutrition and that was one of the thing in it was we only accept donation through the ministry of health so all the ngos will not go directly to the hospitals or to the camps to give infant formula it has to come to the ministry of health and we we can only use it when necessary if the mother cannot for some reason breastfeed so when we had the the mod slide this was better managed and the ones that we had left over were used in hospitals for very very sick children or whose mothers are very sick and cannot so in this standard of procedure we had this um manual now that is called SOP standard of procedure during emergency this is what all the NGOs have to follow when we do have a disaster thank you that's a very useful uh, piece of information for everyone any other questions others what to do uh good afternoon good afternoon everyone i'm uh, babatunde okunola from nigeria i'm a journalist uh, working in the north central part of the country my question is this we keep talking about um uh, we've spoken about exclusive breastfeeding now in the part, in my part of the world uh studies have shown that in recent years after 3 months the women have to return back to work and then you have conflicting situations of labor laws and labor rules so my question is this how do we make those more favorable uh we seem to be winning the issue when it comes to exclusive breastfeeding but after 3 months the women go back to work and then some of them have to resort back to the supplement 
So labor laws and women and the babies in between that. That's my question. Hello, my name is Cyril Langman. I'm the uh, senior partner for the maximizing quality of the Scaling Up Nutrition program. I have to say I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to hear the context that, in which Gerda put this. And I'll reframe it in a slightly different way. I think of it as the fierce urgency of now. I really do. I think that we've got to prioritize, as all the different speakers have said here, there are some low-hanging fruit. We've got to prioritize what we do, when we do, how we do. Because even, even for a couple of days, as many, many of you know, there's a sort of long claw that is drawn across the life cycle for babies who are suboptimally fed into adulthood, into development, into their uh, earning potential. And so at this stage, in terms of low-hanging fruit, may I suggest as one of many things that we continue to bring an evidence-based lens, which again, I know some of our colleagues, Josephine has mentioned, a technical lens to be able to, even today, start saying, what can we do? What are some of the practices that are happening which are so suboptimal, as Donna mentioned, such that people are being given things off a plane which we don't even know much about? And where can we, how can we come to what we know works right from the very start? So this is more of an affirmation of what you've all been saying. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? So maybe I will bring it back to the panelists. And I will open it out to, to whoever wants to respond to, to the questions. Uh, I'm assuming that, uh, or should I, should I target you? <laughs> Maybe we can start with Donna, and then we can go around. Yes, start with me. It gets complicated as it goes. <laughs> so uh, I want to address the question on RUTF. Certainly that is an issue with my country as well. We just uh, adapted the treatment guidelines for severe acute malnutrition, and we're scaling that up among our local governments uh, because they are implementing. And that certainly is a question that comes up quite frequently because, and well, it is very much commodity-based. And so there's move now from within my country to actually look for alternatives. Um, there is actually another group that has sort of formulated their own equivalent in as far as something like RUTF. But mind you, we have to remember that RUTF is used for indication. It is used for confirmed severe acute malnutrition depending on the measurements, the anthropometry and what the child presents with. Sometimes it's being used, and I've learned this from our sorties in scaling up, it's being in use by health workers just because they think it will benefit the child. But really, the messaging then should be different. The child should be just fed adequately with good uh, nutritious food. So that's one thing. And that also then uh, cross cuts one other issue in as far as the training that our health workers are actually getting on the ground. So, and then you have again universal health coverage when you need that quality of care and sustainability, right? And there's accountability as well. So that's about our ETF. I, I will highlight that there was a recent response, as I said, uh, in southern Philippines, in Marawi, where the conflict was. And there were mothers, and it's making me cry because the mothers actually came. Uh, the mothers actually came to uh, the proximate city to where the conflict was because they were evacuated. The mothers from the original city, Marawi, was evacuated too. And there was not much response at all. It was chaos. This was armed conflict that had happened. And so these mothers from a nearby city descended upon, upon these internally displaced mothers. And they just really grassroots, just uh, a pocket of activity there. And they started calling for support. So definitely it was a civil society move, but definitely not organized at the start, but it caught on 
and they were able to provide breastfeeding counseling, breastfeeding support, and beyond that, so they did that initial response phase, but then the beautiful part was that they were able to mobilize funds and that they were actually able to somehow arrange for market-bought foods to be delivered to these women in evacuation camps and to their children. And this they were able to maintain for around four months. So, that was, so that's really, again, civil society action. And it would have been much better had there been really organized local government support. But it, again, it was shot because of, of the current situation. Situation. But this is, again, a beautiful highlight of what civil society can actually do. It, it really could be on a different level had it been more organized, correct? And then just the, the final thing, I think, about uh, the labor laws. This is also something that's quite close to my heart. In the Philippines, we only have like six weeks of paid maternity leave. So, And it's an issue right now. There's legislation on the floor in my own uh, Senate and also in the House of Representatives. And this is something that's being fought because it's business and then it's breastfeeding. Right? So, and then we have to paint the bigger picture, really. Like in my country, stunting, which we've established is already sourced from suboptimal breastfeeding, is actually equivalent to a loss of about 3% of GDP annually in my country. So it's really how you reframe it for your policymakers. Because 3% of GDP is the loss that we sustained with Typhoon Haiyan. So can you imagine sustaining Typhoon Haiyan every year because of stunting? So it's really how to reframe the issue so that because, you know, they, they follow the money, and again, that's my time. <laughs> but I wish you well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if I talk about the RUF, in fact, uh, and uh, I agree with my president. In fact, it ready is to use food, eh? Ready to use food. Therapia. Okay. We don't. RUTF, RUTF, ready to use therapeutic food. You see. It is, uh, it, it is now in some countries, and WHO recommends to add it to the essential drugs. In fact, it is not a food, it's a therapy. And it is only a therapy for severely, acutely malnourished child. Uh, most of the time is admitted in one of the health facilities or feeding centers, uh, who is not able to use the normal food. So considering it as a therapy, it cannot be excluded from all over. It has to be continued using. But RUTF ready, ready, ready. What would you call? Ready to use. Ready to use. If you if you remove the therapeutic part of it, yeah. and you take only ready to use food, yeah. which means a packed food that has some nutrients in it and is to be used by a child, it depends the age of that child. If that child is less than six months, it's completely, completely not good for the child and for. And what can now contain that is the law, is the country, is the government, is the structure which is there. It is the responsible agent that is now uh, running that feeding center or that area, or whoever is, is responsible for that. And there is a competition between the, 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 the business people and the logic people, in fact, who want to use the logic things. Business always want to sell things. So when it's the manufacturer, they want it to go to, to somewhere, whether it comes into the form of donation or it comes into in the form of, uh, of, of subsidized prices or whatever it comes to. Their aim is just to sell, but it's us, the nutritionists, the people who are uh, now fighting for nutrition to actually educate the people. And that's now the nutrition education comes the first thing because it, the choice is made by the mother. When she's not at the feeding center, she's the one who goes and buys something. So it is much better and in fact is sustainable to use locally manufactured or made foods because that is accessible to many people and it can be made even at home. But manufactured foods cannot do anything. I see one minute remaining there. Uh, let me go to one, one point of the labor uh, and, uh, and the breastfeeding. In fact, so many mothers go to labor to work. 
but others also do not have work, but they have responsibility. When the mother has a child to breastfeed, but she has three more children to take care of, she has to go even the first day, not to wait even for the first month. There should be a way of teaching that mother how to continue breastfeeding with those difficulties, particularly with the topic of conflict-affected areas, where you don't have and uh, laws to be modified because the mother is anyhow forced to go and look for food for the rest of the family. So there should be a way of teaching that mother to continue breastfeeding and at the same time cope with the, uh, with the problems and the fragility that she is undergoing. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. Um, to the um, journalists in, uh, of India, I would say there is no size uh, that fits all. I think you need to think what is the challenge in this state of India or in India as a whole. And indeed, sometimes you uh, need this uh, ready to use uh, therapeutic uh, food, and sometimes you don't. But um, it's up to the government, including the different stakeholders, civil society, research, uh, and all how uh, donors eventually, but also private sector, to develop a plan where in which uh, India can support its people and people get to have their own dignity and stand in their own strength. So um, this is also something to, because I know in India you have very fanatic uh, civil society organizations. Not all civil society organizations are as cooperative as the ones we have here around the table. Sometimes they are very very fanatic, and we should invite them to also come to the table and get an overall picture. Because one thing is for sure, only the government, together with civil society, will not succeed in ending malnutrition. You need private sector, but then a private sector that is constructive, that is ready to dialogue, and that is ready to contribute to prosperity of all people, leaving no one behind. To uh, Nigeria, I would, uh, I would say, we are. We have a Sun Business Network, and in the Sun Business Network, um, they are redrafting the membership criteria. And members of the uh, Sun Business Network, big companies, small and medium companies, need to have a workforce nutrition plan, which means decent nutrition for all workers, which means decent maternity leave, which and and it also includes decent breast uh, uh, feeding opportunities for once women return to uh, to the work, because this is crucial. And companies who are showcasing this and are a champion in their own because they believe uh, in it can also advocate among other peers, among peer uh, companies. But it, it, it should be hand-in-hand uh, -hand government legislation and company behavior may be challenged also by civil society. There you have the movement approach, because you need uh, uh, the, the, to change the system. Uh, Sierra Leone, I agree with your approach because it is uh, if it, if it is to bring to uh, have coherence and to have a position in the government to take the ownership of coordinating. I would uh, be more critical if it's uh, a, a, an, an approach to control everything, but if it's an, an approach to bring the coherence to overview but to do it in a, in a transparent way, I would say this is recommendable for, uh, for all. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We're we only beginning to discuss this important. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I start with the India. I think for me, a, a state like India, the focus should really be around prevention, right? Yes. And these children who fall through the cracks, the some children are the ones who will need treatment. The second point is, a some child has nine times the chance of dying as opposed to a normal child. So therefore, there's a need to make treatment available to those who need it. But how that is done is actually this, has to be discussed with government in terms of what resources are available. So I don't think it's a question of imposing also, but making sure that you have your analysis right and what uh, approach is feasible. That's one. The, the second uh, question was in relation uh, which country? Uh, Nigeria. 
uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. And indeed, oftentimes, for some of us who have been both in development context but also in emergency, I ask myself, why should I go to Bangladesh and there's an emergency cyclone, which is something that can be planned, and there's no structure existing to have effective promotion of infant and young child feeding. Why? Why should there be influx of uh, uh, breast milk substitute? Why shouldn't there have been a system in place to ensure that there's policy on uh, maternity cover and all that? Why shouldn't there? So this is where actually the governments who are here, that's where you have to hold the UN agencies accountable, working with you to ensure that those frameworks are there in terms of the policy framework, the systems in the hospital, the community level structures, which should be the basis for promotion, as well as the, the health structure and then the policy aspect. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then finally, the question from, uh, not a question, but the comment from Sierra Leone is a part of it, preparedness. I really think the Ebola opened all of us our eyes in terms of what could have been done before so that when push comes to self, we have the structure, the SOP, the guidance that can advise everybody when this happens, this is how we should interact. And that is not only the, on, in terms of the SOP, but guidelines, capacity that is available, what uh, um, you said about ensuring we reach out to the structures that are there, the civil society that are already on the ground, not just running in and doing what we think needs to be done. And finally, MQ, son, I, I, I mean, I can't, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we are so weak in advocating based on evidence, convincing everybody around the table if we, this is the situation and if the cost of not acting is X, Y, Z in terms of economic health whatsoever. And it's only then that we can convince everybody whether development or humanitarian and work together. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, not that we are not doing it, but I really yeah. think yeah. that would no, inject we some different We're running ways. out of time, but this mm. is the second time that I hear mm. uh, somebody making the case that mm. losing GDP is a convincing argument. Uh, no. I strongly doubt it. Mm. I would like to turn it into the positive uh, mm. side. If mm. you can make the business case mm. of increased GDP, yeah. if you are prepared mm. and you have have a lot of uh, um, uh, measurements uh, in uh, place, activities in uh, in place. You do much better because it's much more appealing and convincing. Yeah. No, the positive one. I'm not saying that the, the, the okay. cost of not doing, but if you do it, what would happen? Ah. How do you, you know, okay. bringing the human? No, bringing the human face. To, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. We are on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Our time is running out, but I think. Uh, this is this is a topic that we will be dealing with more and more. I think we've heard of some very good uh, uh, inputs, and I want to first thank the audience for very passionate questions and very very in, uh, involved uh, 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 attendance presence here. So appreciate that. And I want to thank each of the panelists for uh, setting the stage for our. Continue, think, continue thinking and continue way forward. And I don't think we should wait for evidence to come before we act. And I no. Think action is done. no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>